Recently, our good friend drummer Kenny Aronoff stopped by Sweetwater for a master class and a workshop, and our own Nick DiVirgilio had a chance to sit down with Kenny to discuss his technique, how he came up with some of his famous drum parts, as well as his career. Check this out. How you doing, everybody? I'm Nick DiVirgilio, and this is Kenny Aronoff. How you doing, buddy? Welcome, man. Good to see you, man. Great to see you here. Yeah. It was wonderful to hear you play. Yeah, thank you. Now, you've been coming here to Sweetwater for a number of years now. Yeah. What's it like to, uh, to see this place and how it's grown since you first started coming? It's unbelievable. I mean, it's, it used to be just a, a place I'd call up on the phone, and then, um, uh, and then when I came here, I was just blown away how big it was. And it, every time I kept coming, it expanded more and more and more and more. I think Chuck had a, a vision on the future of the, the music buyer, you know? Right. And so it's kind of a combination of, of uh, a place that you can buy online all over the world and also they have an actual store here so you can come by and see it. Mm -hmm. And then in this, this theater is I've done some uh, lecturing and presentations uh, both for the public and you know, for uh, you know, uh, business you know, people, marketing or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But it's, the, the place offers so much to, and, and it's such a benefit for the music business and the music, you know, music in general. Sure. Um, yeah, so the place is growing. It's like walking to, to Google or something. <laughs> you know, it's like so, so relevant and so, so happening. That's you know? awesome. Well, we are very excited about drums and the world of drums at Sweetwater, especially recently. You know, our business is just growing like crazy. So really excited. Awesome. Great to have you here. Awesome. Now, you've had a really long story career. You've done countless recordings, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of gigs, yeah. uh, clinics, master classes, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. You're even an author now. Yeah. So my question, my first question for you is, what are you doing now as far as your drumming is concerned? How are you keeping your drumming to where you want it to be? Are you still growing in your drumming? Are you practicing different things than you did in the past? How, wh where's your drumming at now compared to where you were even 10 years ago or yeah, more? Yeah, that's a good question. The, the most important thing is to maintain what you are. I, I think that uh, the same things that get somebody to becoming successful uh, are the same things that can keep you successful. Because if you think that you be can become successful and then stop working, uh, you know, or practicing, sure. that 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 that's you're, you're gonna go down. I mean, there's this guy, this golfer, Jason Day, who won seven PGA golf tournaments in ten months, and he he attributed to practicing six hours a day, seven days a week, even though he was winning. He kept the skill, the thing that made him become great, he kept going. So for me, I created a, a functional practice routine because, which means I, I practice specifically things that'll make me sound great today, and I, I narrowed it down to uh, uh, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, because I just don't have time, because now sure. I'm like basically running four businesses between the sessions and all the different touring and the live gigs, plus that authoring a book for four years took a lot of time, days off on tour. I'd sometimes be 16 hours, you know, trying to fix and clean up sections of a book, and then um, and then I do a lot of speaking now, which is a constant uh, thing I'm working on. You know, developing, redeveloping, sure. practicing that like I practice thing, anything else. So this practice routine I do on a pad. It, it involves all four limbs, and I, I looked at what things I need to practice so I'll sound great right now. You know, take care of business first. Okay. And it literally does make me play, not only does it maintain where I'm at, but it, that extra 3% that you can lose if you don't practice, mm -hmm. like in one day, it keeps that level up. And then I'll sometimes do it three times a day, like in the, you know, in the morning, if I get up in the morning, but you know, early <laughs> in the day. Then if I'm on tour, I'll do it before the show. Okay. And then, I'll, crazy enough, I'll do it sometimes at 3 in the morning before I go to bed so that... I'm that much more warmed up when I wake up in the morning. Amazing. So is there a way that you could show us some of that? You don't have to go yeah. through the whole thing, but it'd be sure. great to show a little bit of what you're talking about here. All right, so go ahead. Show us what you're talking about with your all practice right, so routine. I can, all my videos and all my technique exercises, are, or a lot of them are based on 13 hand patterns. You probably heard them, you know, the stick control. Sure. But I, I, I reverse lines 11 and 12 so you wouldn't have seven rights in a row. Basically, I'll start, and, and I should say this, I'm always using my feet and hands together. So if I'm working on a hand pattern, I include my feet because when you play, you do use your feet and your hands together. You're doing the same thing with your feet or are they just kind of keeping time for They're you? They're just keeping time. Okay. So it's, I'm trying to, and I will design 
foot patterns. In other words, when I say functional practicing, I'm trying to get the most out of everything. Sure. So for example, if I'm going through these 13 lines that I'm gonna show you, at one point I'm doing a double bass drum pattern with my feet, because I really need, always need work on that. Sure. You know, it's, it's my, yeah. my hands are more natural at playing than my feet. I've put more time in it. So that's an example of working on hand patterns, but at one point I'm using the, the right, left, right, left bass drum uh, 60 note pattern just because it's an opportunity to not only put the two together, but I'm working on my double bass drum. So the patterns are basically this. It's like singles. Uh, the first two lines are singles. First line starting with the right hand, se second line starting with the left hand. So you got right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Second line is left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. And then the third line and fourth line are doubles. The third line you're starting with your right, so it's right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. Fourth line is left, left, right, right, left, left, right, right. So now you've got four patterns. The fifth pattern is a, is a paradiddle, and that's a summation of the first four lines. Right. right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left is a paradiddle. Right, left is the first line, right, uh, right, left is the first line, right, right is the beginning of the third line, left, right is the beginning of the second line, left, left is the beginning of the fourth line. And then I do lines six, seven, and eight are variations of that paradiddle. And then line nine, 10, 11, and 12 are now we're getting the three stroke patterns, like line nine is right, 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 left, right, 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 left. Line 10 is left, 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 right, left, 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 right. And then there's two other ones, I'll run through these. And the last one is the big, Bonus, I guess, is doing four strokes in a row. So right, 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 left, 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 left. So if I were to play these things, you know, you'll be able to hear this way. Right. So, so the first thing will be, I'll play eight notes with my hands, and I'll play quarter notes with my bass drum. So it'll be with my right foot, one. And I'll do this first with my heel down. I run through these things with three foot patterns. I have a lot more, but just to give you an idea, for one foot patterns, heel down playing quarter notes, like you're tapping. Run through all 13 patterns again with your heel down with your left foot. Now and that run... really works your shin and your calf muscles a lot and too, doesn't also, it? And also, dude, I noticed that when you play with your heel down, you stretch this ligament back here. Achilles so even if you play with your heels up, it makes me play better with my heels up. So, for, um, and I should say that I do, which I'm sure you can relate to, Certain things I play with my heel up, certain things I play a little bit further down, and certain things I have to put the heel down. If you're doing like doubles, you want to get the beater off the head so that the, the, the double hits or triple hits are even. Da 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 da, or da 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 da. You have to get off the, the bass drum head so the tone is the same. You can't slam the beater in the head like I like to do when I play quarter notes. Sure. Um, so having that technique is important. And then the, th the third pattern I'm going to show you today is you're playing double bass drums. You're doing 16ths now, but your heels are down. I do all these exercises again, but with my heels up. So I'm doing, see, that's what I'm saying, functional practicing. I'm actually exercising those techniques I need. So, so you can hear the patterns. I'll try to do the right hand here, left hand here. Okay. So one, two, three, line two. Three, right, right, left, left, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, these are triples, eleven, twelve, thirteen, left foot, right, two, Left foot, three, four. I won't go through all these. Here's the parallel five. Now we'll go to the third foot pattern, right? The, the double bass drum doing this now. And what makes it tricky here is that the hands and the feet are doing the same rhythmic figure, 16th notes, but your hands are changing patterns and your feet are staying. You want everything to line up. One, two, three. Four, five. I go through all the hand, 13 hand patterns. I do the same exercise again with my feet, my heels up now. So like when I get the double bass drum, sure. I'm doing this. Now that, and I'm trying to make sure everything lines up, everything's smooth. The next thing is I get into what I call, and we haven't even gotten to the rolls yet. The next thing <laughs> is, this is just to warm up. It's more of the molar technique. I do a lot of this because I play so hard, I learned 
to not grip with my forefinger and my thumb so much, play more with the back fingers. And the most basic thing with the molar thing is you're throwing the stick down and relaxing after you throw the stick down. So this is based on uh, twos, threes, fours, fives, and six. So the twos would be loud, soft, loud, soft, throw the stick down and pick it up with your wrist like this. These are called twos, left hand twos, which I had to learn to do because it was, I wasn't used to doing it like, but like my right hand was more natural because that's like a hi-hat pattern. Threes, still, these were all eighth notes, but now you're accenting every three. Like one and two and three and four, one and two and three and four, one and two and three and four, and one and two and three and four. Fours, one loud, three soft. Fives. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, all eighth notes. Six, one and two and three and one and two and three and one and two. Same with the left hand. Twos, threes, fours, fives, six. I use the same foot patterns with it. So you go left hand, create that M. Threes. Left hand, sorry. Fours, foot pattern still going. Fives, six, I'm sorry, five, six. Six again, with left hand. I'll, use, I'll go through all the foot patterns and I play my heels up. And that's just the, the beginning. Wow, so I gotta ask, so you look like you're in incredible shape. Do you add working out or doing any kind of regular exercise along with as much as you play yeah. and you practice like this? I do. Because the reason I ask is, um, you know, we've both been playing drums for a really long time, yeah. and there's a number of drummers now these days who are having to get out of playing and change their life and not play drums anymore because, I, I, you know, their body's broken down and they just play drums for so long yeah. they can't keep up. And uh, drumming has taken its toll on their body. Absolutely. So, um, We're professional you, athletes. Yeah, totally. So does this all keep you in that best of shape? Your technique, do you sit up straight a lot? You look like you sit up straight all the time I do, when you play. I, I do sit up straight when I play. Uh, it was by accident. I, I will play certain techniques if I have to play a lot of uh, fast bass drum notes with my right foot. I'll, I'll lean back. Or if I want to get a certain feel, like a, if I'm doing a shuffle and I want to go ga-ga, ga-ga, Gaga, or something where a lot of repetition, where I need it to be smooth and the feels right, I will actually move depending on where I think I can get the best results. Sure. So, but to, to get to your key question, yeah, I have actually eight steps to being healthy. Um, and um, actually, this is me not in as good a shape as I like as far as being muscular, but, I, I, but at the same time, I do like being mean and lean too. Okay. The, th the eight things are basically this. It's, it's lifting weights, and lifting weights is, is not just to look big. It gives you strength, and you don't have to lift weights like massive weights. It's, a, it's enough to keep your hormone levels up, it, which makes you be young, sure. which obviously I, I've got that going. And um, uh, um, it, it also prevents disease. Hormone, higher hormone levels uh, will help prevent the big three, cancer, diabetes, and and. Heart, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes, not to mention other illnesses. Cardio. Cardio exercises the b most important muscle in your body, which is your heart. Sure. Rumor has it when that goes, you go. So it, it, it keeps your hormone levels up and strengthens your heart. Third thing is flexibility, which is stretching. I, I do that every night before I go to bed, even if it's just for five minutes. Flexibility and strength. Wow. I mean, that's your foundation. Sure. Next thing is diet and I could go on for hours about that. It's basically what, what you don't eat is more important than what you do eat. Instead of getting into that specifically, I'll just say generally, you know, you can eat what you want, but definitely have lots of vegetables and some fruit. fruit the best fruit to have is berries because they're antioxidants. They fight disease. See, if you're sick, all this stuff goes down, right. goes away. You can't play drums. You can't do anything if you're sick. So health is very important to me. So... Um, Stay away from as much processed food as possible. The, th the fifth thing for me is supplements because I travel so much. I take a multiple, multiple vitamin, take a lot of fish oil, which is great for about 30 different you know, vital organs in your body. Um, I take a, a extra D and I take a lot of green food. 
I start my day with green food, protein powder, um, coconut milk, which has no sugar in it, and I'll take a cup of berries, which is an antioxidant, and uh, a scoop of peanut butter or coconut oil. The oil, the fat from the, oil, from the peanut butter or the coconut oil, and the, f the sugar from the berries will cut your appetite down. Throw a couple of shots of coffee in there, and <laughs> you're good to it'll go. cut your appetite down. And you're getting a great uh, kickstart for the day. Sure. I don't drink juice from a, a, a can because it's too much sugar in it. Right. And that'll slow me down. Okay, supplements. Okay, number six is water. Water is like, is, feeds every organ in your body. And I don't drink enough water, you should drink half your body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you should drink 100 ounces. But it literally is, every organ in your body needs water. You can think better, you can, you, you, everything needs water. You can live without food for 40 days, but you can't live without water for more than three. So there's that. Then uh, sleep, which I'm not great at, but I, sleep is important for repairing the body. You gotta repair the body. And finally, meditation is good for uh, taking care of stress, and stress will kill you. So these are the eight things that I at least try to touch on a little bit every day. Sure, that's amazing stuff. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all that. It's real. Getting back for just another couple seconds yeah. about your technique. You studied a long time in the classical world. Right. UMass, right. Uh, University of Indiana. Yeah. You played mallets and timpani and all those things for a yeah. lot of time. So a lot of study there. Yeah. And I notice, and you tell me if I'm wrong, I notice in your hands, the way you hold the stick seems to me like, like you, you would, you're holding a mallet, almost. Mm -hmm. Just the way you're, you were talking about how you yeah. don't grip with the top finger and you hold more of the back. So um, how is that technique been applied to your, because you're, you know, you're a rock and roll guy, yeah. mostly. I mean, you've played every style of music under yeah. the sun, too, but how does that kind of technique work? The study of the technique of classical music, how's it adapted to your rock and roll playing? In many ways, and I didn't understand it at first. I just, you know, you go about your business, you know. Right. Well, let me put it this way. Um, with uh, it, uh, one of the biggest things, the lifting thing, right. um, when you, t to get tone out of the timpani, I was always getting told or yelled at <laughs> by my teachers, like one, Vic Firth, Vic Firth George yeah. Gaber, and, and, and other people I studied, was to get tone out of a timpani, you had to think of not the stroke as one, two, it was more like one, hey, you're lifting two. Up. Yeah. You're lifting up, so you come down, but as soon as you hit, you're lifting up. So that was embedded. Now think about this. So, and, and with the timpani, we learned how to use our fingers to get because when you use your finger, it's constantly bouncing off of the drum. To get a roll, right. it'd be like. So I learned finger technique, which gives you, you know, it's a little bit more finesse there. Um, and, and then, but with mallets, a marimba mallet will just die on the wooden bar. So we had to learn to lift with our wrist to get tone. Teachers always lift, lift, I want more tone. So you always were thinking lifting. It was a weird concept at first. Now, and so you're using wrist and fingers. Now, for legit snare drum, when you're doing, you know, rolls. Specifically, the roll, one stroke is the wrist, and then the other stroke is the rebound, which is you let you, in the exaggerating, you let your fingers open up, stick just naturally bounces off, and use your fingers to get the second stroke. And that's, in, in a nutshell, the double stroke. Right. Single is all wrist, double is wrist and fingers. So all this technique really is, I use it all the time on the drum set. And it actually has allowed me to be able to play many styles of music, not just rock and roll, sure. but I can do uh, New Orleans, uh, I can do country, I can do uh, jazz, I can do uh, blues, I can do uh, R&B, anything, you know. It's just, I've got the technique. And in my practice routine, I, at one point when I'm doing rolls, I do rolls every day specifically because I use them. Uh, I mean, I'll do, if, let's say I'm doing the double bass drum. Singles. Start with the left hand. But then I do doubles. I'll go through 50, 50 counts. My point is I'm, I'm using these techniques. Now, okay, what happened when I got into rock and roll is I took this technique of throwing the stick down. I used to grip, we were told to grip from the thumb and the forefinger. And then you support those fingers with the, the other three fingers, to that fulcrum. Mm -hmm. And some people play in that, this joint, I, in orchestral music, 
it with the timpani and the mallet and the snare drum stick, I put it in here, in that first knuckle. But when I got into rock and roll, well, I was in the rock and roll first, but when I became, uh, you know, academic about it, I realized it's better to put my stick in that knuckle because if you're hitting hard, it's going to go there. Right. Then I got to the point where I realized, okay, I'm trying to lift. I started to get into using my body. In other words, it went from fingers to wrist to arm to forearm. Now I play from my belly button. I'm always thinking of using, that's why you see me when I play, I move a lot. It's because I'm like kind of using my whole body. It's like martial arts. It's like, think about a, a, a tennis player. He swings his whole body. The last thing they hit is the, the racket. The last thing they hit the ball. His whole body is swung through. Same with golf, the whole body swings through. Baseball, last thing they hit is the, the actual bat. The whole body swings through. Well, drumming was sitting down. Well, what I do is I split my body and I play from my belly button. Since I'm sitting down, I'm playing like this, using my whole body all the time. So I took the fingers, wrist, arm to this. Even when I'm playing less moment, movement, I'm still thinking of my body, always moving. And, and that's how I put that classical training into the rock thing. And one more thing I want to add, to protect my hands, I started to go back to the back fingers. That's what happened. So right there, it's like the molar technique. I'm not even using those fingers, more the back fingers. And I use the wrist. It's almost like I, I barely am holding on the stick. It took a while to get that, but that's, sure. all these techniques blended together make me what I am. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. All right, so we're at Sweetwater, and Sweetwater is all about gear. Yep. And you're a drummer, I'm a drummer. Let's talk about your drums. Sure. You've been playing Tama for how long now? 32, 33 years. Is that the only, I mean, when you first started in your kind of professional career, were you playing Tama back then? No, or? no, uh, well, my mom went to New York and got a snare drum at Manny's Music, oh. and it was a Ludwig, you know. Okay. I did Ludwig, uh, Ludwig was the, the company to go to, so I had a Ludwig kit. I still have that kit, and, um, um, and then I, the, the kit, first kit I bought after the Ludwig kit was, I believe it was, a Slingland kit. Okay. I went up, drove up to Chicago. I was living in Indiana. I drove up to Chicago and bought a Slingland kit. And then the next kit I bought was in this, was the late 70s. It was a fiberglass pearl kit with no bottom heads. Wow. Because a lot of drummers in the 70s, like the, uh, the drummers that played with like Gino Vanelli, uh, uh, a lot of drummers had that thuddy, you know, doop, 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 like Harvey Mason in sessions. Sure. That real tight. Yeah, Phil Collins and Phil all that Collins, stuff. Phil Collins, exactly. Yeah. There's the yeah. guy. Yeah. Um, and so I did that, and then, then I got my endorsement with Tom in 1980, 81 or something. Wow. Okay. And That's I, been a long, and, yeah. long road with them. Um, Zildjian, I've been with them my entire life. You now, know? is this a normal setup of Zildjian's? The the A's and that and yeah, that more, kind of thing? I, I moved to 15, new beats are the best hi has ever made. You know, I spent my life playing 14-inch new beats, and 14-inch new beats are basically your, the average, yeah. typical, since the 60s, A hi-hat sound. It, it's the most musical hi-hat you can get, can do anything, from jazz to rock to, you know, whatever. Country, R&B. I went to 15s because it just, I, both are good. 14s are a little brighter. 15s made, I noticed that when I was recording one day in Nashville, I listened to a playback and the producer came up to me and says, you're not happy, are you? I went, no. I says, what's wrong? I says, the hi-hats sound like they're not even part of the kit. It's like the drum set and then the hi-hats. And it sounds like they're getting in the way with the, the guitar sounds. This is when I was starting to get into frequencies. I was getting a little bit more uh, knowledgeable about the drum set, how it affects everything else. He says, what do you want to do? I says, would you let me do that, another take with 15-inch hi-hats? Switch them out. Here's the trip. The 14-inch hi-hats had a higher frequency. These, all these mics, snare, tom mics, overheads, seemed to pick up that high frequency, which made the hi-hats really stand out. When I went to the 15s, they blended into the kit more, not as much high frequencies, and it got just a little bit underneath what that, those mics were picking up. All of a sudden, the drum kit sounded better, I sounded better, and the guitar sounded better. So I started using them. And I'll, d I'll decide which ones I'll use. I start with 15s now. 
Um, and, but I always have 14s with me. Sure. So the 15s are always here. Live with John Fogel, they have 15s with a cable hat, both 15s. Okay. They're just pitched a little different. Right. I tried master sounds, new beats. I just, I do the here because it opens me up. Sure. What happened was I, 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 I had no surgery because I broke it. And um, one day I was getting ready for a Melissa Ethers tour. I'm practicing and my stick went. Whoa. Yeah, thank you. I screamed. I went, where's that ridiculous, stupid cable I had that I don't like? I'm putting it over there so I don't hit my nose. And also I went, wait a minute. This is, makes more sense ergonomically. I'm squared off as opposed to like this and slamming, twisting your back. Suddenly I went, wow. This did present some other problems with you're out here so you're using muscles that you weren't used to. But anyway, I, yeah. I worked through this. This is great. So I play, I'll play this way, this way, and this way. Typically, live, I'll use 19-inch A custom uh, crashes, 19s all the way across. In the studio, I used 18-inch. And my favorite right now in the studio is the Armand Zildjian. Kind of an A. It's an A symbol, but it's got a little bit of K vibe in it. It's like dark and bright. Armand 18-inch medium, medium thin. Armand 18-inch medium, medium thin. And then over here, I'll put a 19 inch because it's further away yeah. from the mics. And I typically use a K. Okay. Some sort of K. That's my basic set. A That's ride, cool. my favorite is a 21 inch A custom projection. I love the bell on it because it's a rock bell. But when you play on it, it's not totally dry. It's got a little bit of wash to it, but you still hear the definition of the ride and it's musical. Great. There you go. Good info. Now, um, your setup. With the wide rack toms, yeah. Have you always done that? Because, as far as I know, I don't know everything. That's for sure. I don't see very many drummers playing with the, the rack toms as wide right. as you do. And then you also have the twelve on your on left, your left yeah. and the ten on your right yeah. instead of ten twelve. So how did you come up with that? And how long have you been doing it that way? I've been doing this since 1981. Um, you know, right about when the car came, got invented. No joking. <laughs> Um, I've been doing it since 1981 because what happened was I got in a John Mellencamp band. I had a big fusion, big kit, like nine toms, 11 cymbals, and he just went, no, I want you to have one rack tom, one floor tom. So he wanted that look of a Charlie Watts, Ringo Starr look. So I got rid of this rack tom, but then when I did this big uh, successful song, Jack and Diane, sure. in the studio I had four toms. So when we went out live, I snuck another tom in here so you couldn't see it so it looked like I had one tom. The engineer said, man, you know, and it was like 12, 8, or 13, 16, 18, he went, man, and, and I didn't have the endorsement yet and the drums weren't the greatest quality and he said, it's just, I need higher pitch tom to cut through these arenas. So I said, well, I got a 10 inch tom, but John will, will not, if I ask him, he'll say no. He says, why don't you tell him why don't you tell him that his vocals will sound better if that tom is there? Anyway, they say, yeah, it was approved. And back then, I was into doing the toms on the snare stand. Okay. I had the snare, the tom on the snare stand there, which actually chokes the drum. But nevertheless, that's, I like that look. Well, the bass drum I had didn't have any tom holder on it. So I had to put that 10-inch over there on a snare stand, which put them way apart. But the cool thing was, for TV, you could see me. Very and, smart. And John had educated me on, look, dude, it's not just about how you sound. It's about how we look. Sure. John was into the whole presentation. No logos on any equipment. So anyway, I got used to it. Okay. And I was not playing fast, complex, high technical music, so it worked fine. I had no problem. Well, I got used to it. I've just learned to be able to go flipping around this kit, even though they're spread apart. And I, I dug that reverse tom thing, it became my signature sound. But check this out. I mean, if you're doing, it's, it's definitely high to low. Or, I might spend a whole song not hitting the 10, and all of a sudden I do the same fills, adding the 10. And there's sure there's some nerdy drummer somewhere in another part of the world going, wait a minute, how did he do that? Thinking my 10 is there, he's doing all kinds of chords. But that's not why I did it. It just became my thing. It's just a, it's a, another way to be musical. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And are you using Star Classics 
now, Star as far Classics. as Tama is concerned, or what's the what's the main kit you use all the time? Star Classic Maple and uh, Babinger are my two favorites. Okay. Um, both equally as good. I mean, the Star the thing about Tama is they're consistent. From the beginner kit to the top, you can get the same quality with a $600 kit if there is such a thing. You know, the beginner level kits yeah. is the same quality as the high-end kits. And, uh, but I love Star Classic Maple. That's what I have set up in my studio right now. But I use Babinga on the road. I think with Fogarty, John Fogarty, I use Maple Kick Drum and Babinga Toms. And always 24 inch? You go down I love 24, but I spent a long time, in my book I talk about how the whole recording industry, or, 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 or recording for me had changed. Think about this. Up until about 2005, everything was like, you build everything around the drums. For sound, feel, parts, tempo, everything, timing. You had to get those drum tracks right because everybody overdubbed to the drums. Well, I always used, most of the time I always used a 24 inch kick drum. It was rock and roll, had low end, had punch, had some air in it, it was great. All of a sudden I walk into a session, a Michelle Branch session, and the producer, I'm overdubbing drums. Key word, I'm overdubbing drums to finish tracks. Four guitars in that speaker, four guitars in that speaker recorded, background vocals, loops, bass, keyboard pads, just, my point is there was so much information already recorded, now I'm overdubbing to that, and the first question I asked him was, are you keeping those parts? And he went, yeah. I'm like, wow. So I set up my normal, or my, my, my crew set up my normal kit, and, I, and I'm getting a take, and I'm like, I've got it. I know when I've got a take, and I look in there, and they're like, like that, I'm like, uh-oh, something's wrong. I walk in there, and the first thing, he said, what do you, the producer said, what do you think of the sound? I went, oh, man, the kick drum is lost. Bottom line is, I had to start playing with different equipment to accommodate fitting in and overdubbing two existing tracks. So I went to a 22-inch kick drum that day with no head, packed and muffled. Right. So I had the attack, had the low end, put room mics farther back, just about at 15 feet where the low end really builds up. So you get the attack from the inside mic, no ring from the drum, but you get the low end from the, uh, from the, the mic out there. So you got punch, low end, fit into the track now. Snare drum, I had to tune differently, used a different snare drum than I usually use. And the other thing that was heavy was I sounded laid back in the track. And I know I wasn't. And I, he says, well, I said, What's, what do you think's wrong? He says, you tell me. It was a critical moment because it was up to me to solve the problem. Okay. You know, as opposed to them saying, well, do this, this. It was up to me. And I'm thinking, when I'm thinking, I mean, the red light went off in my head. I went, man, you better figure this out or you're going to be replaced. So I went, all right, bring the drums up with the click track. I want to see if I was off. I was spot on. I'd bring the drums up with the click track and the loops. It was all grooving. I went, there's an instrument that's on top of the beat because I sound behind. So I went, bring up rhythm guitars. Brought up the rhythm guitars, and they were on top of the beat with the click. So I look at the producer, he says, the rhythm guitars, right? I said, yeah. Well, he's the producer, songwriter, who hired me. And he's looking at me. I don't want to insult him. So he <laughs> says, well, it's me, right? I says, yeah, but don't worry about it. I can take care of that. I went out there put the rhythm guitars way up in the mix, put the click way down, and got rid of the loops. Played the, the rhythm guitars, because they're keeping them, and I scored a touchdown. Sadly, now we sound like a band. That's it's a great education right there, because obviously you've played in so many sessions and had so many recordings throughout your life. You've really had to, as a professional, you have to learn how to adapt to your situation. Yeah. Obviously, that's a great story of how you do such a thing, and yeah. you, you adapt to the situation Absolutely. you're in, yeah. and you play for the song. Yeah, absolutely, Nick, and it doesn't matter what career you're in. When you get experience, you become a problem solver. You just, not that I'm a genius, I've just put in gazillions of hours, so I start to become more knowledgeable about the whole process, and now I'm a guy who's supplying information. You know, and somebody might look at me and go like, well, I play as good as him, how, how come I don't have that gig? So, you know, I'm not just hired because I'm a great drummer. There's all kinds of other reasons why I'm hired. 
get along with people. I can sure. solve problems. I can adapt to situations. When I walk in to do so, a, a, a TV show like the Kennedy Center Honors, which is the President of the United States is there, and there's all these dignitaries and, and, and Hollywood, and there's 16 cameras shooting, it's live, and you're playing with Sting, and Bruce Springsteen, and Elton John, and, and Dave Grohl, and Chris Cornell, and it goes on and on. You can't make a mistake. And if something goes wrong, I'm relaxed enough to know what to do to fix it sure. live. That comes from a lot of experience, you bet. and that's why a guy like me is hired. You know, you, bet. you know this, but I'm trying to share this with people that might not understand. Like, well, wait a minute, I play faster than him. I, I, <laughs> whatever it is, no, it's about, so much more involved with the equation. For sure, you it's know? really good stuff. Yeah. So, out of the th thousands of songs you've played on, can you give us a few that really are sort of your favorite? I mean, if you can even answer that. I mean, give us a couple examples of. Kenny Arnoff, essential Kenny Arnoff. Well, if I go back to the Mellencamp days, there's one song that I like to point out because it shows how important the beat is uh, to a song, how it affects a song. And I have, a, I have four concepts that I talk about, uh, the four concepts of playing drums uh, that uh, apply to all music, and that is pick the beat of the song, the beat affects the song, affects the other parts, uh, time, obviously, having control of time, and then three is groove. Those three things are your foundation that will make you sound unique to you and three things that you need to do to be a great drummer. And that's your foundation and then look at it as like a cake and then the icing, which is the decoration or creative ideas you add to that without dis disrupting the beat time and groove. So here's an example of a, of a beat I used on a song called The Authority Song. The original hi-hat part, I want you to focus on the hi-hat, was accented eighth notes. Like And then my foot was. And I was into Charlie Watts back then and Stuart Copeland. And Charlie did this thing where he would play, when he hit the snare, he'd come off the hi hat. I thought that was cool. And Stuart would do a lot of stuff on the hi hat. So I went. Stuart influenced me to play some of these fills that I wouldn't normally play. All right, the point is, when the bass, the bass player had started off by playing with my foot, you know, boom, doo 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 like I did with, with my beat. But when he heard me start doing this thing, he was listening to the Stones and the Police too. He changed his bass player to boom, doo 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 It was a whole different vibe. Yeah. Guitar players are hearing this, and they changed their rhythm guitar parts, whole song changed. All I did was take two hi-hat beats out of the equation. Yeah, silence is just as, as important as yeah. the sound. It's, it's information. Good. Yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the big ones. Of course, Jack and Diane launched my career, and, and the original beat to Jack and Diane was a little ditty about Jack and Diane. It was a ballad. Right. So then I programmed this on a, a Lin one. The bass drum became a tom tom. The snare drum became hand claps. Hi hat became a, a tambourine, and then programmed it. Programmed it out of each sound was an output on the back of the Lin one. Went to the tape, and they had control of the way they want wanted it. But it still wasn't. A, the, the, pr the whole point was to develop the song to keep the listener interested. Sure. And after an intro verse chorus, it's like oh, we've heard everything. So. John wanted me, I think it was after the second course, to have a, do a drum solo. I'm thinking, drum solo on a ballad? On, I just couldn't even, I was thinking Buddy Rich or Gene Cooper or Billy Cobham, but how do you do a drum solo? It really isn't a drum solo. It's featuring the drums with a musical idea on the drums. That's what it is. Sure. It's music. So we spent a whole day getting a big drum sound in a big room because that was new. People used to put the drums in vocal booths so they could control the sound more. So in a big room, they had to figure out where to put the close mics, overheads, room mics, blah, 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 go through all this gear to get this sound. My point is nowadays you can get a big drum sound in 20 minutes. Right. But back then it was all new. We were experimenting. It paid off because th sure. that song became number one, launched my career, and the album became number one, won a Grammy. And this song is still played on the radio 
three billion years later. So what, I, what happened was, okay, I got a drum solo, so I'm like, oh my God. And I'm learning now, for the, by being in the John Mellencamp band, I was learning a, no, a new vocabulary, how to play simple and serve the song. Uh, I became the drummer I used to make fun of as a kid. I made fun. I was listening to jazz drummers and people with technique, and I thought Ringo Starr, who's my idol, and Charlie Watts, they can't play. That stuff's so simple. But now I, I bow down to them. It's a different approach to playing a different language. So, long story short, I thought, okay, John's music simple. So I'll make an entrance and make it real simple, real simple. Do do do. God, drum machine. Do do. I just did boom blam and stopped. I look in the controller and they're like, awesome. I'm like, Whew, still got my job. So then everybody goes down the tom toms. So I thought I'd go up the tom toms. And so I, what I did was I took the rhythm that, I, that was programmed or the rhythm came from my bass drum, which was. And I went and did a whole bunch of other stuff. Well, they didn't like it. And I'm like, I remember I was in the control room and everyone's telling me what they think and I'm going like, you know, trying to gather all this information. I, I'm walking back to the drums and I'm thinking, you got 25 feet to save your career, 20, 15, 10, what are you gonna play, Ken? I'm like, I had no idea. I spun around and maybe it's the, 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 the education and the training I had had in classical music and studying drum set after I graduated from college Something told me in my head, well, just try the same, same thing, but just start an eighth note later. So instead of starting on one, I started on the end of one. Yeah. I have no idea how, why I came up with that. So that would sound like this. One, two, three, one. The same displaced rhythm, but I started eighth note later. And before I could finish, John's hitting the button, talk back, hit a cr cymbal crash, which means obviously he liked that. So I went. So I'm there and I'm like, I gotta go down the drums because I've gone up. So I just kind of borrowed some of Phil Collins' standard fills from In the Air Tonight and I, went, I ran out of drums. So I had to do something. So I added a Kenny Aronoff thing, which was, I, did, I played a triplet after that. Which led into the next thing. Uh, these are cliff notes, this is a quick version. So John is like saying, don't stop, groove, man, play the drums. So I started by playing. <laughs> Believe it or not, the reason why I was going to the Tom was I was listening to Steve Gadd play this Mozambique, which was like I thought, that's cool. So I was trying to get to the Tom on beat four to get that thing, and the hi-hat opened up. And then John says, too much hi-hat. Went back and forth, back and forth, and finally it turned into. <laughs> and then they put vocals on top of that, so let it rock, so let it roll. And I, that was suddenly, I had this big drum break on a song that went to number one, and everybody's like, who's that? And you know what, to finish the story, is that the album before, I had been recording at Cherokee, and I, I basically was fired from that session from John because my vocabulary at playing, serving the song, coming up with simple parts that worked for his music to get on the radio, I didn't have that skill yet. Even right. though I'd played with Leonard Bernstein and graduated with honors, and I was like this successful guy, my skill set, for, for pop music was underdeveloped. They replaced me. So I, to make that record was a big deal for me. And the same hotel room, Chateau Marmont on Sunset, that I got cut from that record before was the same room. This song went to number one. And my wow. reaction was this. Oh my, oh my God. Can I do that again? <laughs> Am I really number one? The song's number one. Everyone's gonna think I'm really great. I gotta practice more. Ooh, what should I practice? What do I practice? How do you practice to play simple? I mean, all, all those right. thoughts went through my head, which gives you an idea of what kind of person I am. I was not, it wasn't like I got this licked. 
Right. I was in fear that I don't have it licked. I have a okay. statement, that I, and I, maybe I want to say that to, be, to you, and, and people should hear this, I will never be as great as I want to be, but I'm willing to spend the rest of my life trying to be as great as I can be. And that, to me, is human condition. We're not perfect. And as long as you're willing to embrace that, then you realize you don't score a touchdown every time you get a ball in your hand. And like those big running backs do, they spend the rest of their life trying to get into the end zone. And at the end of their career, then they realize what they've done. They're just focused on getting touchdowns. And it doesn't happen every time, but eventually it does happen if you keep trying. If you do nothing, you get nothing. Mm. Zero equals zero. Well, that's awesome stuff. Thank you so much for sharing all of yeah. this stuff with us, Kenny. Thanks for coming to Sweetwater. You're here to do a couple of master classes tonight, and, and uh, you're on a book signing tour. So congratulations for everything that you've achieved. Thank you. And thanks so much for showing us your technique and the way you play, and just best of luck with everything else Thank you're you, do. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. You awesome, Nick. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Kenny Aronoff. Thanks for joining us for the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Mitch Gallagher.